Let's perform a little thought experiment, shall we, folks? I'm going to say three simple words, and once I do, I will then spend the next several minutes sharing with you my fondest memories and most deep-seated opinions which are directly associated with those words. I'd like for you, in turn, to think of your own memories and opinions about this phrase. Feel free to share them in this video's comments if you're so inclined. So, without further ado, the phrase in question is Hitman Blood Money. When I hear those words, I think of an exemplary game in the stealth genre which was developed and published by IO Interactive all the way back in May of 2006. I reminisce about the fact that this title was my first real foray into the world of stealth games, outside of more kid-friendly titles like Sly Cooper and the Thievius Raccoonus. Lastly, I also ponder the idea shared by many people that Blood Money constituted the zenith of the Hitman franchise. I'll be discussing each aspect I've just mentioned in what I consider to be appropriate detail throughout the rest of this video. As I said in my Forgotten Journeys article on Blood Money, which you can find linked in this video's description if you'd like to read it, I like to say this title essentially showed me how to think like a professional assassin would. Considering the game's subject matter and the fact that it tasks players with controlling a man who was, quite literally, created by a mad scientist to be the perfect contract killer, I think the fact that Blood Money has the ability to put players inside Agent 47's head, in a sense, really works in this title's favor. It just dawned on me that I should probably explain a few things I've just said for the sake of any of our viewers who might be completely unfamiliar with the Hitman franchise and or any aspects of its story. Let's start with the basics. You play as a man known to his employers and to the world as Agent 47, Mr. 47, or simply 47. That's because, as I alluded to a moment ago, the main character of the Hitman franchise is a clone created from the genetic material of five of the world's best and most ruthless murderers, whether they worked for hire or otherwise. 47's creator, Dr. Otto Ortmeier, needed a way to differentiate his clones until he perfected the one who would ultimately go on to become the assassin we know from this series. So he did what any sensible person in his position would do. He tattooed barcodes and specific strings of numbers onto the back of the heads of each of his creations. Agent 47 was, as you may have gathered by now, Dr. Ortmeier's 47th clone. Due to this, he was subsequently officially identified as 640509-040147. It just rolls right off the tongue, doesn't it? Now, obviously, that string of numbers would be too much for the average person who is neither an accountant nor an otherwise insufferable nerd to remember, much less use as a form of identity. Thus, our legendarily bald protagonist decided to simply go by 47. I should also mention that Dr. Ortmeier psychologically conditioned his creations in such a way that they would prove unquestioningly loyal to whomever knew how to control them. I bring that up because that notion brings us to Agent 47's employers and how their hierarchy is structured. Well, kind of. For the entirety of Blood Money and its predecessors, Agent 47 is employed by the International Contract Agency, or ICA for short. Every field agent, that is, assassin, who works for the ICA is partnered with a handler, who briefs each agent on their upcoming assignments and serves as the agent's primary liaison within the ICA. 47's handler is a friendly-sounding British woman by the name of Diana Burnwood. For most of Blood Money's campaign, however, players in 47 only know Diana as a faceless voice on a cassette tape as she provides 47 with the details of each playable mission. Welcome to the States, 47. This should be a straightforward operation. We need you to penetrate an abandoned amusement park, locate the owner, and take him out. The target is a Joseph Clarence, also known as Swing King. An accident involving one of the rides at the park a few years back forced him to close it down. Our client has made a special request that the photograph you have in your possession be the last thing the target sees. Mr. Clarence has somehow become involved with a narcotics distribution ring, so the park may still have some amusements. Enjoy the ride, 47. Speaking of each playable mission in Blood Money's campaign, let's move on to discussing this title's gameplay, shall we? The game is kind enough to start you off with a tutorial mission in which it demonstrates all the new gameplay mechanics it introduces compared to its predecessors. 
For example, 47 now possesses the ability to conceal dead or unconscious bodies in appropriately sized containers to prevent anyone from stumbling across his handiwork and figuring out that an assassin is afoot. In every Hitman game that came before this mechanic was introduced, 47 would just have to leave the bodies of those he knocked out or killed in what seemed like an unguarded location and essentially hope for the best. I think it's worth noting that if 47 killed or incapacitated whomever he hides in such a container in a particularly violent manner, such as by shooting them, nearby NPCs will still investigate any blood they happen to notice. However, as far as I've been able to tell, no one will actually open any of the containers that might hold one of 47's targets, thus ensuring the bodies won't be found regardless of the presence of blood. As another example of new gameplay aspects introduced in Blood Money, 47 can also climb into the hatches of elevators. Upon doing so, he can use his trademark fiber wire to strangle a target who is also in the elevator from above. As a notable bonus, doing things this way will cause 47 to automatically hide his target's body in the hatch. Therefore, this process allows 47 to quickly, cleanly, and quietly eliminate a target without even having to find a place to dispose of them afterward. If that isn't the definition of efficiency for a contract assassin, I don't know what is. If 47 enters the elevator and climbs into the hatch before his target could potentially see him do so, they'll have no idea if he's even there until it's too late. There are a few missions in the campaign during which this tactic could prove quite useful, so I'm glad the game has players try it out in the tutorial mission just to make sure that anyone who might be new to the series knows about it. There are two more major aspects of Blood Money's gameplay that I want to highlight before I move on to discussing the game's overarching plot. The first of these is the ability granted to players to make each target's death look like an accident should they choose to do so. Yes, you can simply walk up to your target and shoot them in the face with a silenced pistol to get the job done with little to no regard for witnesses or armed guards. Heck, sometimes that's even the most efficient way to go about your work. However, the issue I have is that this approach really doesn't seem like Agent 47's style in my opinion. I mean, Dr. Ortmeier didn't spend obscene amounts of time, energy, and money creating the perfect assassin, only to have his creation fail to take his predetermined light of work seriously. To that end, you can arrange for your targets to be in precisely the wrong place at precisely the wrong time in a variety of creative ways. Allow me to elaborate. These accidents can range from what I call the quick and dirty, such as sneaking up behind a target and pushing them off a ledge, to the somewhat complex, like rigging a pyrotechnics display to explode in the exact spot your target will soon be standing, to the unreasonably risky due to the chance of injuring and or killing innocent bystanders and witnesses. Each assassination target in the game has at least one method of an accidental death. It's up to you to discover these methods and judge whether they're worth putting to use. The final gameplay aspect I wish to mention in detail before moving on is the new notoriety system. First and foremost, I should note that this mechanic doesn't come into play whatsoever on the easiest difficulty mode for reasons that I think are obvious. This makes it so that you don't have to worry about generating and removing notoriety while you're still getting used to the game. At least, I would presume that's the primary reason you would play on the easiest difficulty setting unless you just want to laugh at the, at the antics of the less intelligent AI. Provided you're playing on at least normal difficulty, you will have to contend with this gameplay mechanic. As you go about completing your missions, the notoriety system forces you to stay incognito as much as possible and be as efficient as you can while carrying out your grim tasks. This is the case because if you aren't exceedingly careful, any witnesses you don't deal with will report what they saw to the local authorities. Even if they just happen to look you in the eyes for a split second as you walked past, they may very well report it. Information like that adds up over time. The more information that law enforcement agencies have about you, the clearer a picture they can develop as to your identity and appearance. It turns out that it's not that hard to track down a six-foot-tall, almost completely bald man with a barcode tattooed on the back of his head in a $5,000 suit given enough time. In any case, if you don't keep your notoriety levels in check, there will eventually come a point at which armed guards in any mission will simply open fire as soon as they see you. I understand wanting a challenge in this context, but being actively hunted down from the second you set foot in a mission venue is a bit over the top in my opinion. To prevent things from reaching that boiling point, you can use portions of the money you're paid for completing missions to do such things as, as bribe witnesses to keep their mouths shut, or convince local police chiefs to suddenly suffer a catastrophic and accidental loss of any evidence related to you or your deeds. 
As I said a moment ago, however, you'll want to try to be careful enough to prevent your notoriety level from escalating too much in the first place. You don't want to wind up spending those particularly handsome paychecks on bribing witnesses when you could be purchasing vital upgrades for your arsenal of weaponry, now do you? At long last, let us now move on so that I may discuss Hitman Blood Money's plot and why I love the story this game tells as much as I do. Considering the game is 15 years old at the time I'm recording this voiceover, I doubt I need to include a spoiler warning. Even so, just in case, we're venturing into spoiler territory as of now. Blood Money's story is told primarily through a series of between-mission cutscenes. During these cutscenes, a journalist by the name of Rick Henderson conducts an interview with former FBI director Alexander Leland Kane, who inexplicably insists on being called Jack. Rick Henderson, first edition. He's expecting you. This way. Rick Henderson. I've been looking forward to this. As have I, Mr. Alexander. Don't let's stand on ceremony. Call me Jack. Rick. Make yourself comfortable, Rick. I'll be right with you. I admire your work. Real journalism. Thanks. I thought we'd start with your thoughts on the White House attack, then discuss your tenure as director of the FBI, post-retirement reflections, whatever, and- Rick. Or if you want to sound off on politics- Rick, my apologies. This interview about me is just a cover for a more sensitive story. I'm sorry to have lured you here under false pretenses, but I couldn't risk a leak. I'm not sure I understand. Don't worry. It's the scoop of the century. If I had a dime for every time I heard that... Listen, please. It begins with a little incident at a vineyard in Chile that caught my eye some time ago. This was a family business. Fernando Delgado and his son Manuel. Well-liked, hard-working men. Have a look at the folder. Mr. Henderson hopes to interview Director Kane about his accomplishments throughout his career and, more pertinently, an in-game attack on the White House, which we'll get to shortly. However, his hopes are soon dashed as the director explains there that he summoned Henderson agenda. to his home under false pretenses. Rather than discussing anything Rick had on his agenda, Kane makes it clear that he intends to only Don't discuss the, the jacket, presence sir? and previous handiwork no, of Agent 47. Of Henderson is particularly shocked by this turn of events, especially since he falls in with the crowd of people who think of 47 as nothing more than an urban myth. However, he's somewhat swayed when Director Kane provides him with classified FBI documents about assassination contracts which the US government strongly believes were carried out by our legendarily bald protagonist. The trail of documentation begins after 47 eliminates a bankrupt, disgraced, former amusement park owner in Baltimore, Maryland, which is the objective of Blood Money's tutorial mission. After completing that assignment, 47 accepted and carried out some contracts outside of the United States before returning to bring about another slew of assassinations on American soil. It seems the FBI wasn't the only powerful external force that was keeping an eye on 47 as he went about his work, however. The ICA soon found itself in the crosshairs of a rival contract killing agency known simply as The Franchise. The Franchise and its particularly nasty employees make a habit of neutralizing ICA agents left and right until things reach the point that, as we learn in a later mission briefing, Diana and 47 wind up the only two remaining people on the ICA's payroll. This development leads Diana to split the ICA's remaining financial assets 50-50 between herself and 47 so that she could dissolve the agency and go into hiding. In the briefing that plays before the final mission 47 receives from Diana, she instructs him to quote, eliminate the target and anyone that targets you, end quote, before escaping in a vehicle she has waiting for him in a nearby parking garage. 
That ominous quote indicates that the franchise has found 47 and they intend to eliminate him before he can beat them at their own game. At this point, I'd like to pause momentarily so that I may include a bit of a personal note as an aside. One of my favorite parts of Blood Money's entire campaign can be found within that same mission briefing. Since the mission in question may well be the last time 47 and Diana interact with one another, Diana takes the opportunity to tell 47 that working with him has been a pleasure. She goes on to add that she hopes that the future is kind to him. That particular bit of dialogue never fails to tug at my heartstrings, though I've never been able to put my finger on exactly why that is. That won't stop me from making an educated guess in order to see if I can't figure that out, however. I would imagine that ICA agents and their handlers are supposed to maintain a strictly professional relationship given the nature of their line of work. Yet, from the almost heartbroken tone of Diana's voice as she delivers those lines, it truly seems to me as though she and 47 have formed a much stronger bond than that. 47 successfully eliminates his original target during the ensuing mission in addition to a pair of franchise assassins who are looking for him. Upon entering the vehicle Diana arranged for him to use to leave the scene of his latest contract, 47 is unpleasantly surprised by the presence of a man whom he considers to be little more than, an, than a liability and an annoyance. That man is Carlton Smith, an agent in the employ of the Central Intelligence Agency who's known for inadvertently getting himself into trouble. Smith and 47 have something of a history together, as 47 was tasked in an earlier mission with rescuing Smith from an alcoholism rehabilitation facility, which kept him sedated so as to interrogate him under the guise of keeping him as a patient. You. I should have known. Sedating me. Psychotropics. The things they've done. <sighs> Figures. They'd send you to clean up my mess. Th this is the guy. Here. I'm getting you out of here. They'll never let me out alive. I know. Identity obtained. Executing rest of assignment. Remember how I said a moment ago that 47 basically thinks of Smith as someone who just gets in the way and makes things worse? Well, because of that, 47 is just so overjoyed to see Smith pop up in the back of the aforementioned getaway vehicle that he pulls over in the middle of the desert, pins Smith down, presses a gun to his head, and demands a reason not to kill him right then and there. This leads us to the in-game attack on the White House I alluded to earlier. In his haste to provide 47 with a reason to spare his life, Smith explains that the franchise has infiltrated the White House and plans to send one of their best assassins to execute the President of the United States. It turns out that the franchise is in the employ of a shadowy organization known as Alpha Xerox, whose members presumably are excellent at photocopying documents. The President's death would allow Alpha Xerox to install their puppet, Vice President Daniel Morris, into the most powerful position in the United States and, by extension, the entirety of the free world. The franchise and its handlers want the current US President, who remains unnamed in the game as far as I recall, to meet with a terrible fate because he intends to legalize cloning. More specifically, he seeks to allow the free usage of the very same cloning process that led to the creation of Agent 47. The legalization of this process would financially ruin Alpha Xerox because they intend to monopolize on Dr. Ortmeier's techniques and data while cloning remains illegal. Of course, Alpha Xerox would much rather avoid being rendered destitute and having its existence revealed to the general public. Unfortunately for them, things don't quite work out that way, but I'm getting ahead of myself. In light of this troubling development, Smith asks 47 to infiltrate the White House in order to assassinate both Vice President Morris and Mark Parchezzi III, the gunman assigned by the franchise to neutralize the president. 47 initially scoffs at Smith's request, simply and coldly retorting that he doesn't do politics. Thankfully for Smith's sake, he's prepared to offer 47 millions of dollars worth of diamonds in exchange for his work. It's almost as if Smith knows this is the best way to speak 47's language. I think it goes without saying that Agent 47, being the genetically perfect killer he is, capably manages to carry out this possibly unofficial contract with relative ease. 
That constitutes the aforementioned attack on the White House, but this event does not yet conclude the game's story or Rick Henderson's interview with FBI Director Kane. Unfortunately, however, that's essentially all I can tell you about Blood Money's plot without spoiling the rest of its events, and more importantly, its canonical conclusion. As much as I want to gush about my thoughts on how the game ends, all I'm willing to say, for the sake of not ruining the experience for new players, is that the game's true ending and the events leading up to it are quite cathartic in many ways. Before I move on and begin my closing statements, I want to briefly mention two things I quite like about Blood Money aside from everything I've said thus far. Firstly, I very much enjoy the fact that the titles of each playable mission in the game's campaign actually directly pertain to the mission's objectives. This can give players a hint at what will be expected of them during the mission, while also potentially serving as a source of light, pun-based amusement in certain respects. To name a couple of examples of what I mean by this, consider the fact that the game's second non-tutorial mission is entitled Curtains Down. Within this mission, 47 is tasked with eliminating an exceptionally prominent opera singer who is accused of some particularly vile crimes. You've got some business at the Paris Opera. There are two targets, the famous tenor and Richard Delahunt, the American ambassador to the Vatican. Our client claims they're behind a prostitution ring trafficking in boys and girls from Eastern Europe. Tosca is still in rehearsal, so there's plenty of activity at the opera house and you shouldn't be too conspicuous. Ambassador Delahunt watches most rehearsals from his box. He travels with an armed escort, but there shouldn't be any other security to speak of. You'll get some cover from the construction crews renovating the theatre for the new season. We've also left you a pickup in the cloakroom. In the third act of Tosca, the tenor faces a firing squad. That scene may provide a useful opportunity. It's a straightforward assignment, 47, but the agency's been having some problems. As a secondary, potentially less obvious example, the mission wherein players must assassinate Vice President Morris is known as Amendment 25. For those unaware, this refers to the 25th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which establishes a direct line of presidential succession in any scenario in which the president is removed from office or is otherwise unable to discharge the powers and duties of the presidency. Essentially, this mission's title is a nod to the fact that, had the franchise and Alpha Xerox succeeded in assassinating the sitting president, their pawn would assume the powers of that office as per the referenced constitutional amendment. The second aspect of Blood Money that I want to briefly bring up at this point is its exquisite soundtrack, which was composed by the legendary Jesper Kidd. The song from Blood Money's soundtrack, with which I suspect you might be the most familiar even if you haven't played the game, is what I consider to be an outstanding rendition of Franz Schubert's Ave Maria. As I alluded to a moment ago, this particular piece of music has become so deeply intertwined with Blood Money that I would almost bet you'd know it if you heard it. I would wager that will ring true whether or not you're the least bit familiar with the game. In fact, if you listen carefully, you'll hear a portion of Ave Maria in one of my esteemed colleague Kieran's recent videos right after an excerpt of the game by Motorhead that Kieran himself performed. In all honesty, just hearing that song again for the first time in years is almost entirely what inspired me, by which I partially mean gave me the excuse, to create this review. Having said all of that, I believe the time has come for me to move on to the topic that will constitute my final thoughts on Hitman Blood Money, at least for now. You'll recall that I mentioned at the beginning of this piece that a considerable portion of Hitman fans believe Blood Money is the zenith of the franchise. That is to say, many people believe that the series began going downhill with the entry following Blood Money, 2012's Hitman Absolution. Personally, I'd like to think I can see the reasoning behind this argument, but I also disagree with it. Now don't get me wrong, I absolutely adore Blood Money and everything it has to offer. I know the layouts of most of its levels like the back of my hand. Heck, until fairly recently, I was among that crowd of people who believe Blood Money is the best in the entire series. That was the case until 2018 rolled around and gifted the world Hitman 2, the sequel to the eponymous 2016 reboot of the Hitman continuity. I was equally shocked and delighted by the fact that Hitman 2 managed to dethrone Blood Money as my favorite game in one of my favorite franchises. I think I can see why Hitman 2016 and Hitman 2 don't appeal to many fans of Blood Money and its predecessors as they do to people like me. Some Hitman fans prefer to be placed in a smaller level and left to their own devices when it comes to assassinating their targets, without the game holding their hands quite so much. Where I think the disconnect lies, at least in my mind, 
is the possibility that the get that the much larger and more open levels of Hitman 2016 and its sequel kind of overdo it on the whole complete the mission your way idea. However, that's just one reason I'm glad Blood Money is readily available on Steam. Aside from the facts that Blood Money has precisely zero native controller support and doesn't sync its save data to the Steam cloud, it's quite nice to know my original g favorite game in the series is in my library waiting for me, waiting for a day like today when I finally have an excuse to spend some quality time with it. As for the topic of Hitman 2 dethroning Blood Money in my eyes, this is how I think of it. Blood Money was king of the hill for 12 years as far as I'm concerned. I'd argue it was high time to let a new game have a chance to earn that designation when Hitman 2 showed up. I can get the money, sweetie. It's as good as mine already. Mr. Spook's got it. We'll open the park. It'll be like old times. No, no, just a few more days. You gotta believe me. Don't say that, sunshine. Mr. Spook's gonna come true, baby. He's good for the money. I won't sign the papers. I won't. You gotta give me one more chance. You gotta. Baby cakes? Sunshine? Hello? Uh, it's been a while now, uh, Scoop, and I was just wondering uh, where we were on the whole money thing. Were you? Yeah, see, the thing is, if you remember, you know what we agreed to was it'd just be a short while and you'd pay in cash and... Uh, and uh, I know the, what the pressure was you were under must be, but the deal is a deal, and I was hoping, you know, maybe you could just pay what we agreed on, even though you've been here for, heck, more than twice as long as we agreed to, but, but just pay the original amount and move on. Not right away, necessarily, but, you know, I'd appreciate it. No. <laughs> Who the hell are you? How'd you get in here? Carol Ann! My client has hired me to show you this photograph. I don't understand. My client has asked me to ensure it's the last thing you ever see. Please, look at the photograph, Mr. Clarence. Oh, please. Haven't I suffered enough? Uh, don't you think I know how much suffering I'm responsible for? I can't sleep. I haven't slept in... The guilt I feel. I'm so sorry. I know I can never... Don't shoot! I I'm innocent! I can see... I'm here to see Joseph Clarence. Never heard of him. Mr. Swing King? Oh, that's sorry ass virgin. What the Water f buffalo call you? Names of a friends, so I don't need one. 